So good afternoon. I'm Norman Walberger. We're here at the University of New South Wales. And we're continuing on with this course in the history of mathematics. It's been a year since we uh, posted uh, the, our last video, so we're all a little bit older and wiser, perhaps. Today we're going to talk about the number theory revival. This is following chapter 11 of Stillwell's book, uh, in which number theory sort of takes its place on the stage of mathematics, largely due to the work of Pierre Fermat. Okay. And he's really the main instigator of setting up this theory of investigating arithmetical properties for their own sakes, and not necessarily connected with geometry. So Fermat is one of the towering figures of uh, modern mathematics, and he's a very interesting fellow because he was not a really a professional mathematician. He was a lawyer and he lived in Toulouse or near Toulouse in France in the year 1601-1665. And he had a very sedate, uh, pleasant life, productive as a legal fellow, but he also had this uh, great output of interesting mathematics. But he didn't actually publish a lot of his uh, works formally. His mathematics was conveyed to other mathematicians by letters. And he didn't correspond with uh, that many of them. So he, his influence was not perhaps felt at the time as much as it is now. So Fermat worked in, in a number of different areas and he contributed in an important way to analytic geometry. He was one of the co-discoverers of analytic geometry with, of course, René Descartes. He investigated properties of curves and tangents and contributed, in fact, to uh, some of the preliminary work uh, before the calculus was discovered. And some people uh, give him credit for some of the discoveries in, in, in calculus. He also uh, was uh, interested in, in other things. He uh, did some work in optics and other areas, but his main interest was in number theory. which wasn't really a subject uh, back in his day. So what had happened in the number theoretical, uh, in the pure number theoretic uh, context before that? Well, we had basically Diophantus. So Diophantus of Alexandria lived around 200, 300 AD. And he, we've talked about him already, he was a fellow who studied equations with rational solutions. And he wrote a book called Arithmetica. which um, was uh, recently translated uh, in, in Fermat's time in the Greek, and that was one of the very uh, influential drivers of Fermat's thinking. Of course, we have the work of the, uh, the Arabs and the, the, the uh, Greeks and the, uh, the Hindus uh, after this period, who also contributed algebraic uh, tools, but sort of in terms of purely arithmetical uh, considerations, there wasn't a lot uh, between the ancient Greeks and Fermat, with a, another notable exception, that of Levi ben Gershon, who's also referred to as Gersonides. And he was a Jewish scholar who lived around the time of 1300. He was also an astronomer. And he was very instrumental in discussing 
combinations and permutations. So, of course, the binomial theorem goes back long before that. We have Pascal's triangle going back to the Chinese and so on. But uh, Levi von Gershon was perhaps the first one to understand the combinatorial significance of Pascal's triangle and the binomial theorem. So he uh, introduced the combinatorics associated to the binomial theorem. And so let me remind you that if you have something like a plus b to the fifth, then if you expand that out, you have basically five products, a plus b times a plus b times a plus b times a plus b, and one more, a plus b. And the binomial expansion is just what you get when you expand all of that out using the distributive law and collecting terms. So nowadays, all students know this is a to the fifth plus, and then there's some numbers, which we get from Pascal's triangle. So there's the relevant fifth row. So the coefficients are a to the fifth, and then 5a to the fourth b, plus 10a cubed b squared, plus 10a squared b cubed, plus 5ab to the fourth, plus b to the fifth. And Ben Gershon realized that there was some counting going on here, that if we look at one of these terms, for example, say this one here, where do we get the 10 from? Where's that 10 coming from? Well, we're looking at all the ways we can get a cubed times b squared when we multiply something from this one times something from this one and so on times something from this one. So we have to choose one term from each one of these brackets and combine them. And we're looking at how many ways can we get an a cubed times b squared. So this 10 was the number of ways that you can choose, say, two b's out of the five brackets. Altogether, we're going to get three A's and two B's. And if we know where the B's are coming from, then the A's are coming from the other ones. So it suffices just to worry about which brackets are going to contribute the B's. Well, how many ways are there of choosing two brackets out of the five? That's one way, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those are the ten different ways of choosing two out of the five brackets. And those correspond to the various sums that contribute to this total here. So this 10, which uh, okay, has nowadays the, the symbol 5 choose 2, is the number of ways of choosing two objects from a collection of 5. And because it's symmetrical with respect to the A's and B's, we could also say it's the number of ways of choosing three A's. So it's the same thing as the number of ways of choosing three A's out of a total of five. And in general, Gershon, uh, Ben Gershon also gave a, a formula for these numbers as the formula that high school students learn these days. So the formula is that n choose k, that's often the way it's described with words, n choose k is equal to n factorial over n minus k factorial times k factorial, where this symbol with the exclamation mark, say k factorial, means 1 times 2 times 3 times all the way up to k, the product of all the numbers from 1 to k. So for example, 5 choose 2 would be 5 factorial 
over 3 factorial, 2 factorial. That's the same as 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 divided by 1 times 2 times 3 times 1 times 2. And so he explained why that formula arose. And of course, we do get uh, 10 after we cancel various things. You can cancel that 1, 2, 3 with that 1, 2, 3, and then you just get 20 divided by 2, which is 10. So this is, a, this is an arithmetical thing because we're talking about numbers. We're interpreting numbers in terms of counting things. And the, the numbers are not exactly associated with geometry in the traditional sense. It's really numbers doing the job that numbers are supposed to do in terms of counting. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's come to Fermat's uh, work. And some of the ideas that he introduced, some of the pro problems he was working on. And in many cases, he left things a little bit open-ended because he didn't provide proofs for some of his claims. In fact, for most of his claims. And so people didn't really know how he thought about things. And they didn't know, in fact, whether he actually entirely knew what he was claiming. And it took in uh, many cases, uh, quite a long time after Fermat's dates for someone else to come along and prove the things that Fermat had claimed. In particular, Euler, who I've stressed before is the greatest mathematician of modern times, he's, his interest in, in number theory was stimulated by getting a copy of Fermat's work. And uh, his friend Goldbach gave him a copy. And he started investigating this stuff and thought, well, this is great. And he ended up taking some of Fermat's ideas and, and sort of completing them or working hard to try to understand what uh, Fermat had done. And he was able to make some progress, quite a lot of progress, in fact. Uh, but then more progress uh, had to wait for some uh, later, later mathematicians, in particular Lagrange. And then other people who were very influenced by these developments were Legendre and Gauss. So these are amongst the, the, real, the, the great mathematicians of modern times. So let's have a look. What kinds of problems was Fermat interested in? Well, he went back to the ancient Greeks and the kinds of problems that they were interested in with perfect numbers, related things called amicable numbers. And he became interested in, in divisibility and, uh, and related issues. But there were rather a number of very specific things that he discovered. Quite uh, beautiful and remarkable things. So some results of Fermat. Okay, so first we might say that um, a prime P of the form 4n plus 1 can be written as a sum of squares in exactly one way. And almost all of these, almost all of these results are concerned with natural numbers. We're thinking about equations with natural numbers. And here the motivating equation would have been the Pythagorean equation, x squared plus y squared equals z squared for a right triangle with sides x, y, and z, which of course had been studied uh, by the ancient Greeks, and Diophantus knew a lot about this too. So the question is, one way of interpreting what this is, uh, is about is to ask which primes can be realized as areas of squares in the integral plane. 
So if we restrict ourselves to just integral values or say positive integral values and we cook up uh, a triangle, say, uh, say that one there, then you can build on this hypotenuse, you can build a square and the area of that square will be Well, by Pythagoras, it's going to be the area of this square plus the area of this square. And that's going to be have area 9, and that's going to have area 1, so that this thing is going to have area 10. It's a solution. 1 squared plus 3 squared equals... 1 squared plus 3 squared equals 10. So this is, an air, this is a, a number. 10 can be written as a sum of two squares. And Fermat was interested in, okay, well, let's, let's say we just restrict ourselves to primes. Which primes can be written as a sum of two squares? And the answer is the primes of the 4, 4n plus 1 can be written in exactly one way. And our sister result is that a prime p of the form 4n plus 3 cannot be written as a sum of two squares. So for example, if we take a prime of the form 4n plus 1, so that's one more than a multiple of 4, for example, say 29, how would we write 29 as a sum of two squares? Five squared plus two. Well, it'd be 5 squared plus 2 squared. On the other hand, if we take a prime of the form 4n plus 3, for example, 31, and we write it, or try to write it, as n squared plus m squared, then you can go through all the possibilities, and none of them will work. Okay? So this one... No solution to this one. There is a solution to this one, not this one. And interestingly, there's exactly one solution, even if the prime is very, very big. Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so all this discussion is with numbers which are integers. Yeah. Yes? A sum of two squares, yes, I didn't write that. Thanks. We're talking about a sum of two squares in exactly one way. Well, he discovered a little bit more in this direction. He investigated further and discovered that if p equals 4n plus 1, in that case, p squared is also a sum of two squares in exactly two ways. And p cubed is a sum of two squares in exactly three ways, etc. So for example, uh, the simplest uh, such um, prime uh, is, is p equals 5, so p equals 5, which is of this form, then 25 can be written as Uh, 3 squared plus 4 squared, so that's for p squared is a sum of two squares in two ways. Okay, so
What's the other way? Like five squared and zero squared. Five squared equals zero and zero squared. We're allowed to put zero. And okay, well, one twenty five. Um, that's equal to uh, 100 plus 25. So it's 10 squared plus 5 squared. And there's also two other ways. Um, maybe I'll leave you to try to figure out what they might be. So this, this became part of a, a very big theory, just the start. Okay? So there's a very natural question here that, that the later mathematicians uh, took up. So the very natural question here is, given a quadratic form. All right, so that's a, a quadratic expression in, in two variables. For example, it might be uh, n squared plus m squared, or it might be 2n squared plus m squared, or it might be something like 3n squared minus 4nm plus 7m squared. These are all examples of quadratic forms. They're quadratic expressions in two variables, n and m. So given such a thing, the question is, how can we write a general integer in, by using this quadratic form, in the form of such an expression. So can we write um, an integer k, let's say, in terms of other integers n and m in this form? So let's say, let's say the quadratic form is in general q n of m. So the question is, can we write a general integer k as q of n m? And if so, so that might be yes or no, but if so, in how many ways? So these are sort of very fundamental kinds of arithmetical problems. They're the sort of first hard problems that you get to uh, when you go past the linear problems. Because they're quadratic, it's essentially quadratic equations in integers, really. So you can write down the quadratic formula, of course, but the question is when is the thing that underneath the square root going to be a square? Okay, so it's a number theoretical question. Of course, examples of this kind of, kind of uh, thing had already been discussed. Uh, in antiquity. We've already talked about Pell's equation where you have x squared minus dy squared equals 1. Where d is some number that's chosen in advance, which so is not square. That's an example also of such a kind of thing. We're asking, in this case, how does one write 1 as an expression involving this quadratic form? So this kind of equation had been around for quite a long while in terms of Pell's equation. But Fermat realized that there was actually a much more general set of questions that one could ask. In fact, Fermat was quite interested in Pell's equation and did some work in that. And one of his claims was that if d was not a square, that such an equation always had an infinite number of solutions. So I suppose maybe this is the fourth thing. Fermat claimed that the Pell's equation, x squared minus dy squared equals 1, where d is a non-square, has an infinite number of solutions. He claimed this in letters and he posed this as a problem to 
fellow mathematicians, to English mathematicians, and he was well aware that there were certain values of D that were particularly hard. For example, D equals 61, where the solutions, the smallest solutions, are already pretty big and not likely to, to get to it with, via trial and error. So he made this claim that there was an infinite number of solutions, but in fact the proof of that had to await for Lagrange. Proof only due more than 100 years later to Lagrange. This is a subject that has interested me uh, on occasion, and I've written a little paper uh, called Pell's Equation Without Irrational Numbers. And which appeared in the Journal of Integer Sequences just uh, in 2010. And in this paper, I, I give what I think is probably the simplest proof of the, this fact, that there's an infinite number of solutions to Pell's equation. So it's a very elementary proof that you can uh, have a look at. It just requires some first year understanding of linear algebra. You can find it on the internet uh, if you like. Okay, what other kinds of things was uh, Fermat interested in? He was interested in, in prime numbers. And he investigated the question of, is there some formula for prime numbers? Many people have searched for a formula for prime numbers. And there are probably are lots of people today who are looking for a formula for prime numbers. Some formula that will guarantee you a prime number. But no such formula is known. There's a maximum prime that, that's known and, and that's, that's a record that has stood for three or four years now. It's hard to come up with bigger and bigger primes. But Fermat's idea was that we should look for a, a prime of the form two to the uh, k plus 1. We've talked about 2 to the k minus 1. 2 to the k plus 1 is prime. It's not too hard to see if, if it is prime. It means k is a power of 2. So in other words, we're actually talking about something in the form 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. Primes of this form are called Fermat primes. And it's known that they are prime. They are prime for the first five. When n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And those primes are I thought I had it, I guess I don't, but well, the first one, when n, n is zero, we can get two to the uh, one plus one, so that's three, that's one of them. And then the next one is five, and the next one is 17. And then there's uh, two more, which I don't know offhand. When n equals three and when n equals four, and they are in fact prime. And so Fermat claimed that in fact, this formula works for for any n. You stick any n in and you get a prime number. But there is uh, reason to believe that he, he was doubtful about this later on. Okay? In fact, that claim is false. The next one in the list is, in fact, not prime. But it's not so easy to figure that out. So those numbers are prime, but n equals 5, we're, we're talking about 2 to the 32 plus 1, is composite. 
And that was discovered by Euler, who discovered that 641 is a factor. Now you can be certain that Euler did not use his calculator to figure that out. So Euler would have calculated 2 to the 32 plus 1, and he would have set about trying to see whether it was composite, and pretty well the only way he would have done that is to start dividing it by primes. Divide it by 5, or it's not obvious, it's size 7, go, go through all the primes and divide it each time, and see if you get something where it divides. And once you get to 641, you find that it does actually divide. That tells us a lot about Euler, right? This is the greatest mathematician of modern times. And he's not averse to spending his time this way. He does not mind making a calculation saying, okay, it's early morning, I'm going to compute this thing all day. See how far I get. Maybe that's one of the reasons why he's uh, the greatest mathematician of modern times. Fermat's most famous result, no doubt you all know about, but at number five, it used, used to be called Fermat's last theorem, but uh, now it's often called Fermat-Wiles theorem. And this is a famous result that says that the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no solutions in uh, non-zero integers if n is bigger than 2. Of course, with n equals 2, there are many solutions. All the Pythagorean triples. But for n equals 3, or n equals 4, or n equals 5, or in fact any larger integer n, natural number n, there are no solutions. And the famous story that you've no doubt heard is that Fermat, who was reading Diophantus' book in the margin of uh, that book in a section in which Diophantus was talking about this kind of problem or something related, Fermat wrote, I have discovered uh, the fact that this thing has no solutions and I have a, a marvelous proof of this result which this margin is too narrow to contain. And, uh, and that little comment has sparked a huge amount of uh, work as all important subsequent mathematicians tried hard to prove this result, to discover the proof that Fermat supposedly had. So Euler tried, Lagrange tried, yeah, almost everyone would have tried at some point whether they admitted it or not. Okay. And, uh, and it was only in fact proven in 1994, Andrew Wiles, after a, a seven year long heroic um, study of, of this equation found a, a, a proof but very, using very advanced techniques and, and many ideas that Fermat would have had no idea about. So the, the jury is, uh, claims that Fermat was probably wrong, that he didn't have a proof, and most mathematicians believe that, but we're not 100% sure. There's always some slight chance that maybe there's some miraculous simple proof that none of us have found, although it is very unlikely. But this, this, uh, this problem, in fact, it's, uh, it's not very, a very important problem, really. It doesn't lead to a lot of interesting um, developments on its own. The mathematics that has come out of this has been very interesting, but the problem itself is a bit of a dead end. But nevertheless, uh, it's generated a lot of interesting mathematics. And, and special cases were proven by, by individuals. So in, in n equals 4, actually Fermat actually did write down a proof of this. And it involves an important uh, idea that he called infinite descent. And the idea is a little bit too 
complicated, uh, perhaps to describe at length in a, in a history of mathematics course. But the roughly the idea is that Fermat said, all right, let's suppose that we have integers x, y, and n that satisfy x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth. And then he made various deductions and calculations and reductions and so on. And he eventually ended up with a new set of numbers that also satisfied the equation, which were smaller than the ones he'd started with. He could prove that if you have one solution, then you can get a smaller solution. And then that was enough for him to say, well, then it must be impossible because we can't keep getting smaller and smaller solutions because the natural numbers have a bottom. Once you get to zero, you can't keep going further. So that was a kind of a, a general technique of proof that he recognized that it was a very important idea of his proof, this infinite descent, and he used it very successfully in other situations. N equals three is harder, and uh, that was, had to wait Euler. Euler gave a proof for N equals three, and many other mathematicians then gave proofs, N equals five, N equals six, and typically the proof for N equals five is quite different from the proof N equals seven, and so on. So a lot of work went into this problem, and the problem became famous just because no one could solve it, because it seemed so hard. The n equals three case, as an interesting application to cubic equations. So, the cubic equation x cubed plus y cubed equals one, just in the ordinary x, y plane. It does have two obvious solutions because it goes through the point one, zero, and it goes through the point zero, one. But aside from that, there are no other rational solutions. So it's pretty cl closely connected with the n equals three case for the Diophantine equation is the result that this curve Uh, passes only through two rational points. Which of course is very different from the case of the circle. x squared plus y squared equals one, which passes through an infinite number of rational points. So you might say, well, what am I graphing here? Well, there are lots of points, rational points, which are pretty close to satisfying this equation. And you can think that that's what we're graphing here. This is a, a plot of a point for which x cubed plus y cubed is pretty close to one, but not exactly equal to one. So Fermat realized also that this, this whole problem of, of asking the question, given a curve in the plane, does it have rational points, was a pretty interesting and important question. And that turned out to be a very, very important line of thinking. So the question is, does a given algebraic curve say given by an equation of the form PXY equals zero, where P is a polynomial, have rational points on it. And it turns out that question is pretty simple. The answer is uh, easy if the degree of P equals two. In other words, when we're talking about a conic or a conic section. But uh, not so easy 
if the degree of P is bigger than two. In particular, for cubics, it's already rather a subtle issue. And Fermat introduced an important technique for well, investigating some of these things, which again, in some sense, goes back to Diophantus, but he extended this idea. So let's look at a curve. Let's look at this curve here, which is, well, a folium of Descartes. It's a cubic, and it has equation x cubed plus y cubed equals 3xy. So Fermat realized that Diophantus' idea of, of thinking about tangents could be extended to thinking about secants. So he said, all right, there's something special happening about the point zero, zero here. Let's look at a line through that point. Such a line has equation y equals tx, where t is just the slope of that line. So let's see if we can find this point. We know two of the places where this line meets the cubic, namely this point right here. This is really a double meet. The line meets the cubic twice at that point. So there's one more place where the line meets the cubic, and we should be able to find that out. So if you substitute y equals tx into here, sub in, then what do we get? We get x cubed plus, and then we put this in here, so t cubed x cubed equals, and here, 3x times tx, so tx squared. And then conveniently, the solution x equals 0, which we already know about, is appearing as a common factor of x squared here. So in other words, if I, if I factor the uh, things out, I get x squared times 1 plus t cubed minus 3 uh, I guess there's an x. All right, I guess x minus 3t equals 0. So I brought everything to the one side and factored out an x squared. And I have 1 plus t cubed times x still remaining and minus 3t. So we know that x equals 0 is a solution. Fine, that corresponds to here. The other solution is x equals 3t over 1 plus t cubed. Yes? Uh, should the one in that bracket be x? Because it's like x squared. This one here? Yeah. Well, I've got it in a bracket here. So this bracket is multiplying by times x? Oh, that's it. Oh, okay. But other than multiplying by times x. And so if we found x, then if we go back to the line, then y is just t times that. So y will be 3 times t squared over 1 plus t cubed. So that's actually now a parameterization of the cubic. That means for every value of t, if you replace t with a particular value, you get an x value and a y value that give you a point on the curve. So you can generate the points on the curve in this very simple way with this parameterization. So this cubic has a parameterization. In fact, it has a rational parameterization, which is even better. It has a rational parameterization. Now, in the modern theory of curves, okay, that means that it's sort of saying that uh, this is a genus zero. 
This is a genus zero curve. Let me just put that, uh, that terminology out there. A little bit later in the course, we might have a better understanding of what that might mean. Once we learn a little bit more about complex numbers and a bit of topology. All right. That's a genus zero curve. But not all cubics are genus zero curves. Because, for example, this cubic is not a genus zero curve. Because it does not have a rational parameterization. If it had a rational parameterization, then there would be lots of rational points on it. But we've said that there are no rational points on it. So this thing here is of, well, it's not of genus zero. It turns out to be genus one. So we're getting close to this idea that in the, in the world of cubic curves, there is a big division between certain kinds of cubics and other kinds of cubics. And relating to this question of whether a curve has a rational parameterization or not. And perhaps while I'm talking about this, I'll also draw another picture of, of kind of an interesting and important phenomena that happens with cubic curves that you will not have seen in high school. So if you have a cubic in that has the form y squared equals ax cubed plus bx squared plus Cx plus D. This is one of the Newton forms for a cubic. I rem remind you that Newton classified cubics and tried to put them in families like ellipse, hyperbola, parabola, something like that. And he had a quite a long list, 70 or 80 different types of forms. And one of the things he did was find sort of standard forms for cubics. This is this one kind of form. And if you choose the numbers A, B, and C, and D in the right way, then you can get a graph that looks like this. It's another kind of shape that a cubic curve can have. And sort of along the lines of what Fermat's uh, thinking was going here, you can make the following observation, that if you have two rational points. So let's say you have P1 and P2. If P1 and P2 are rational points on the cubic, then we can obtain another rational point by essentially the same kind of thinking as Fermat was doing in that previous example. What we do is we just join those two points to form a line. And that line typically meets a cubic in three points, because it's an equation of degree three. So there will be a new point. And you can get that point without having to solve a cubic equation, because you already have two solutions. It's the same idea that we had over here. The fact that we already had two solutions allowed us to find this third point. We didn't have to really solve a cubic. The cubic came down to a linear equation. In the same way, uh, if you investigate this, you find that, uh, that the line P1, P2 meets the cubic in a third point, a third rational point, let's say P3. So this is now a fun game that you can do if you have a cubic. If you know a few rational points, you can generate other ones by joining the dots, making lines, and seeing where they meet. For example, in this case here, if this is a rational point, then its reflection will also be a rational point. This reflection will also be a rational point. That means we could say join this one with this one, 
get another line which would uh, meet it again in some other place, um, it may be here or here, I don't know, don't know where we're, should only meet it once, it would give us another point. We can continue uh, generating more and more rational points. And that was a, turned out to be an important, an important development that led to ultimately the group law on a cubic. All right, that's a little bit advanced. It's sort of touching with modern algebraic geometry. And that area of investigation is still, even today, a very hot research topic. In fact, related very, very strongly to the uh, proof of Andrew, uh, Andrew Wiles of the Fermat theorem. And I'll end today today's lecture with just one more interesting kind of thing that, uh, that Fermat was involved in, and that's a sum of four squares problem. So Fermat observed that not every natural number could be written as a sum of two squares. But if you allow yourself three squares, then a lot more numbers can be written as a sum of three squares. But still there are some numbers that cannot be written as a sum of three squares either. And Fermat uh, claimed that, that any natural number could be written as a sum of four squares. So you choose any natural number, then you can write that as a sum of four squares. For example, uh, how about uh, 30 se um, 35. Um, so 25 maybe, and then we have to do 10. Uh, 10 is 9 plus 1 plus 0. There's a sum of four squares. We're allowed to use zero, too. <coughs> Maybe not so impressive when the numbers are small, but when the numbers are very big, it's, uh, it's somewhat interesting. But again, this is a, a result that other mathematicians tried to prove. Euler tried to prove it and made some progress. And uh, it was Lagrange who ultimately um, proved it. Oh, I must, uh, of course, tell you of uh, perhaps Fermat's most important discovery in terms of actual practical applications. No discussion would be complete without that. This is sometimes called Fermat's Little Theorem. For many years, this was just a novelty in number theory. But in the last few decades, it's become vitally important for internet security. So most of the powerful internet encryption programs that we have rely on this result and, and variants of it. So the result is that if P is a prime and A is a number a is relatively prime to P. That means uh, no common factors. Then A to the P minus A is divisible by P. I was very interested in divisibility questions, and he would have not written it this way, but later on Gauss introduced what was called congruence arithmetic, and Gauss would have rewritten this in, in the form A to the P is congruent to A mod P. That's an equivalent statement in using Gauss's congruence language. So for example, if we take uh, P equals 7, let's say, 
uh, we take some number, say uh, a five. Maybe five is a bit too big. Well, let's take, uh, okay, two. Okay. What is two to the seven? Minus two. Okay, so what's two to the seven? 128. 128. So this is 128 minus two, which is 126. Whoop, 126. And that is seven times 18. It's divisible by seven. And that works not just for two, it also works for three, for four, for five, for six, for 723, as long as 723 is not divisible by seven. All right, so Fermat was a, a great genius and sort of a mysterious figure in modern mathematics, the founder of, of modern day number theory and, and his, uh, his legacy lives on very much even today. Next time we're gonna have a look at uh, curves, go back to some mechanics and some interesting curves that uh, the Bernoullis and other, uh, others studied in terms of actual motions. So will see you then. <laughs>